HD. Okay. Okay. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started with our after lunch talk. We have one of the original founders of the file format, Mike Folk here. And so he's going to present a brief history of HDF5. I really look forward to this talk. Although Mike had retired the first time when I started at the HDF group, he came back and gave me tutoring for a couple of days to catch me up. And I just so appreciate his knowledge of the history. And he's just a great guy as well. So thanks, Mike. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Lori. And thank you so much for doing such a great job organizing things here. I also want to thank the, the sponsors. Uh, uh, and especially Surin, because I know it's a big job uh, hosting something like this. And the organizing committee, thanks for inviting me. Um, and Garrett, I think, for cajoling me into doing this. Um, really sorry I can't be there in person. I had some stomach issues and couldn't travel. Uh, Mark, I thought, gave a really great talk yesterday um, on the on the early days of HDF5. So after that, I took out a whole bunch of my material. Um, it was gonna be way too long and way too fast anyway. So, uh, and as always, Mark uh, sets a high bar. So, um, so we'll uh, start with that in mind. Um, I have, uh, let's see, organized the, the, the talk into kind of four overlapping periods, but this is kind of notional. I'll be jumping back and forth, starting with sort of the foundation that led to the creation of HGF5, and then the period of the implementation, and then what I'm calling the growth period after, after the implementation, and then finally uh, something I'm calling branching out. Um, there is so much to cover. I'm leaving out a whole lot, leaving out a whole lot of people um, but uh, this will be at least the tip of, of the iceberg from my, uh, from my perspective. So let's go to the foundations. Uh, it all started uh, at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Um, and Mark actually talked about this data problem yesterday where people had the challenge of moving data from one uh, system to another where the systems had different architectures and different ways of representing numbers. Um, and the poor... Uh, users had to do all of this conversion of numbers whenever they moved it from one machine to another, their data from one machine to the, another. Um, so a committee was formed to try to address this problem and came up with this idea of creating a self-describing format um, and then software that would look into the file and figure out uh, how to convert the data to whatever the host platform was that they were reading the file onto. Uh, it's also important to, to recognize that uh, technologies back then were a little different from today. Um, you moved files from one place to another using FTP or Gopher. Uh, Telnet was how you connected with a remote service. Um, IO was almost exclusively serial. And a typical workstation, if you were lucky, uh, would have a disk uh, space of maybe 500 megabytes. So that was a context. Um, so out of that, uh, HDF was created, the hierarchical data format. Um, it uh, supported uh, raster images, multidimensional arrays, groups, and tables, ultimately. Um, there were local and global attributes that allowed scientists to put their metadata in the file. Um, and under the hood, there was some data compression and some chunking. Uh, and by the middle 90s, uh, version 4.0 was available. Um, but the, really what was important among the people who developed HDF5 was that they were part of a, a larger group whose main job was to create desktop visualization software. Um, and these tools were open source and free and gained a huge following. Um, they required you to have your data in HDF, so they turned out to be the main way that the world uh, outside learned about HDF, and they learned that it could be used for more than just visualizing their software. The big breakthrough came through for, for the HDF group um, in the early 90s when NASA was <clears throat> designing the Earth Observing System, which was going to be used to gather data to understand climate change. Um, and this resulted in longer, they, they ultimately adopted HDF after looking at 15 different formats and doing a two-year shootout 
um, they uh, they adopted uh, HDF as the file as the common file format that they would use for that data, um, and that resulted in longer term funding for us as well as a strong endorsement that uh, what we were doing was of value. Uh, so that kind of gets us to the mid '90s um, and the first crisis that we faced uh, and the sort of implementation phase for HDF5. The crisis was that HDF really wasn't doing the job at the time. It was doing the job that, that most people needed then, but it was pretty clear that uh, the limits uh, of HDF were going to be problematic. An object couldn't be larger than two gigabytes. In fact, a file couldn't be larger than two gigabytes. You couldn't put more than 20,000 objects in the file. Those data types that we talked about, the image and so forth, were, were very rigidly defined. Each had its own kind of code implementation, so the code was more and more complex. And I.O. was just basically serial, so it wasn't going to support parallel I.O. Um, so we knew that, and we were, we were thinking about it and worrying about it and coming up with some ideas. And uh, meanwhile, out west, uh, the Accelerated Strategic Computing Initiative was getting underway that Mark talked about so thoroughly yesterday. Um, I got an email from uh, Linnea Cook, who was one of the managers on the project. Mark mentioned her yesterday as well, uh, telling me about the project, asking if I thought maybe HDF might have a role to play. I responded that no, it wouldn't because it just couldn't measure up to the scalability requirements that they needed. Um, but that we were interested in going beyond HDF, and if they would let us work with them, we would love to do that. Um, and they invited us to do that. So uh, we, we went, went out and became a member of the Data Models and Formats group. And uh, Mark gave you all the details, I think, that, that you need to know about that yesterday. One thing Mark didn't mention was that there was this meeting at, uh, at uh, Los Alamos, I believe it was. Um, and, and one of the folks, John Ambrosiano, was sitting across the table from me, scribbling on a piece of paper while we were discussing, okay, what should the name of this new format be? Should we call it, you know, uh, something other than HDF, or maybe we should call it Big HDF, or what should we call it? And he scribbled this thing and, and uh, passed it across the table to me, and it was this wonderful picture with the caption, I'll be back, um, one of my favorite pictures from, from that era. Um, anyway, uh, the first release of HDF uh, 5, 1.0.0, um, happened in November of 98. Uh, this is a blurb from the HDF newsletter. It says the first release only officially includes support for serial uh, I.O. Um, and then a couple months later, the first official release of the parallel implementation came out. Uh, so we had a library and we were ready to go. And um, there was all this software that Mark talked about yesterday uh, that was being developed. Uh, and that was that was big. Um, however, remembering uh, how much the visualization tools had been in terms of the acceptance of the original HDF, we wanted to have some kind of a viewer that was very HDF focused. So we worked on HDF View, and, uh, and a year later, in January of 2000, HDF View 1.0 was released. Um, and this was a way for people to be able to easily kind of get into an HDF file, kind of look around um, on their desktop. It had some simple visualization capabilities, but, but nothing special that was going to be really left, left to things like visit that could do serious visualization, serious analysis, and, and so forth. Uh, so, so now we're uh, reaching the, the sort of end of the 90s. Um, the, uh, the whole project, uh, as you can tell, was mainly sponsored by the ASCII project. They did the, not only the funding, but they provided a number of, of people, probably, I, I don't know, I think maybe on the order of 20 different folks did serious work on uh, either HDF5 itself or tools that used HDF5 or you know, various things that HDF5 would it be invoking. Uh, it was a, just a tremendous 
tremendous effort that was made by that whole project and I uh, just can't thank them enough and it, it just absolutely would not have happened without that. At the same time, um, it's, it's important to recognize the role that NASA had. Um, NASA had, as I said, adopted HDF for the Earth observing system um, and they had created an API called HDF EOS that would present the data to the climate scientists uh, in a way that made, uh, made climate science sense to them. Um, and as soon as HDF 5 came out, uh, they started working on HDF EOS 5, and it would be exactly the same thing as the HDF EOS API, except it would have HDF 5 under the hood. And they decided that, uh, you know, if this thing is really as good as they say it's going to be, um, future satellites will, uh, will use HDF 5 rather than HDF. The first satellite flew in 1999. And it was definitely used at HDF and still does, um, but all future ones used uh, HDF5. Another important thing that they did, and this again gets us back to this theme of, of visualization tools being so important um, and other analysis tools, uh, they had a workshop in 1997 in which they invited vendors and creators of, of various data tools that were popular in the earth science and climate science community. Uh, they explained to them what was going on, what HDF was, what was going on with HDF and the important role it was gonna play and um, encouraged them to uh, build in support in their tools for HDF and HDF EOS. Um, and uh, not only encouraged them, but provided funding for a lot of them to do that. So that was a really important uh, thing that NASA did that helped uh, ensure the, H the success of HDF. Of course, that was 1997 when HDF-5 came out later. They did pretty much the same thing with HDF-5. Um, the first two satellites that launched as part of the Earth observing system that used HDF-5 were Aqua in 2002 and Aura in 2004. Um, they were designed to be operational for six years, uh, but they're still operational. Uh, and currently NASA estimates that there are about 11,000 users per day who access about 28 terabytes of data um, uh, from, from the EOS system. Um, so uh, that that's kind of gets us to the almost the end of the beginning of, of HDF5. One thing that's nice to point out is that um, we were awarded uh, one of the R&D 100 awards in 2002, along with Livermore uh, Lab, Sandia Lab, and, and Los Alamos. Um, we were very excited about that. Uh, uh, there's a there's a I have a picture of Mark down there in the middle. Um, we're so happy that he was able to join our celebration in Chicago at the Navy Pier. Um, and there's Linnea Cook at the, at the top, who was uh, ex absolutely instrumental in making it all happen. And the HDF group there over at the left with a very stern looking Quincy standing, I think, on the far left. Um, so that was a, a really a nice and fun thing to have happen. Mark is no uh, no stranger to the R&D 100 award. I think his visit also won it uh, as well. So good for Mark. Um, uh, the next period we'll call the growth period. Um, one of the things I want to highlight is, is a paper that was written by uh, Jim Gray and uh, several of his colleagues. Uh, one of the authors is this guy named Gert Haber. Uh, it was it was through Jim that I met Geert, and uh, what a lucky thing that's been for me and the HDF group. Um, the paper says that while the commercial world has standardized on the relational data model and SQL, no single standard or tool has critical mass in the scientific community. And it goes on to say in the next decade, as data interchange among scientific disciplines becomes increasingly important, a common HDF-like format and package for all the sciences will emerge, uh, will likely emerge. Um, that was, I think, pretty prescient. And it also was really great for us to see because it gave us some confidence that uh, what we were doing was somewhat on the right track. 
uh, and, the, and the SQL and relational connection was really valuable and important to point out as well. Um, in fact, one of the first tools to use HDF5 um, developed outside of our group was PyTables. Um, this uh, bunch of guys led by Frances Galtet and his team in, in, in Catalonia created uh, PyTables in 2002, um, three years before that paper was written. I think it provides a, a wonderful queryable front end uh, for scientific data, and it used HDF5 for the data. Um, so like the old NCSA visualization tools did for HDF4, I think PyTables played a huge role in introducing the world to HDF5 and giving them a type of access um, to data, to their data that wasn't available in a lot of, in a lot of other tools. Um, another interesting project that, that emerged around that time uh, was work that we did with the NetCDF group. Uh, I believe uh, Ed Hartness is, is, is participating in this workshop. So hi, Ed, if you're out there. Um, and I believe that he might have been lead developer on this project, certainly was a very important guy and has been a valued colleague ever, ever since. But anyway, the reason this was really important was that uh, NetCDF and HDF, uh, uh, the, the, two, the two groups were, were kind of friendly rivals, but we realized that we really had more in common than, than, than different. And um, the NetCDF folks realized that the HDF library had some capabilities like parallel I.O. and compression that in the original version of NetCDF weren't, av weren't available. And by putting the NetCDF library uh, on top of the HDF5 library, they would be able to avail themselves of the, all of those capabilities. So we wrote a, 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 a proposal to, to NASA and they funded it. It was gonna require some changes and improvements actually to the HDF5 library. And we worked on that, it took quite a while, but I thought that was a, a really nice project and worth pointing out. Uh, another interesting uh, project that we did was with the National Archives and Rec Records Administration around that time. Um, we looked at a, a variety of different things, but among those was investigating the use of HDF5 for long-term retention of engineering data. Uh, one of the problems with, uh, um, you know, a lot of kinds of data where you have a lot of vendor producing the data is it comes out in all sorts of different formats, not necessarily great for archiving, um, and certainly not great for, for interchange uh, among different tools and so forth. And uh, there were a lot of people around the world actually starting with a big project in Europe that started with H the original HDF, looking at uh, ways to handle this kinds of data. Um, and so we were kind of a part of that big community and NARA helped us become an even bigger part of it. And the reason I, I, I think this was, this was particularly exciting was it was a, our first ISO standard, ISO 10303 uh, part 26, um, is a standard for the representation and exchange of what they call product data, a binary representation. Uh, they already had a text-based representation, and uh, it specifies uh, HDF5 as the container for that, for that representation. I, I checked to see if that's uh, still in force, and it was renewed in 2019, so it's still going strong. Uh, while we're talking about standards, there were two other standard uh, standards efforts that uh, I want to mention. Um, the CFD general notation uh, system, CGNS, um, had their own format. Um, again, it was an interchange standard in that industry um, and discovered HDF5 and, and realized that going forward, um, using something like HDF5 would would be would make their job probably easier and they would be able to take advantage of, of new developments and and so forth. Um, and so they adopted HDF, started working with us and continue to work with us. And uh, Scott Breidenfeld is, is our CGNS guy and is just doing a marvelous job with them. Another one was uh, was Nexus. Um, this was a, a, a standard in the particle science community. Um, and it went back into at least into the 90s uh, where they were using the original HDF. And when HDF5 came out, they, they switched over to that. 
Um, and that has also led to a long, very fruitful partnership um, between the HDF group and, and that community. Um, uh, HDF was also finding inroads in, in industry as well. Uh, one of my favorites is Boeing. Um, they had their own uh, internal format uh, for flight test data. So they'd run a flight and the data would be collected in packets and it would go into this format, this internal format that they had. But as technologies changed, they had to revise the format every few years. And they were in the revision process and somebody said, well, why don't you have a look at HDF5? And they did and they realized that if they took, if they started using HDF5, they wouldn't have to revise thing every, things every few years because it was capable of expanding and, and growing uh, in the ways that they needed to. So they created something called HDF Packet um, and they started working with us. Um, and they also created a second uh, internal format called HDF time history. So once the data would come down in packets, it would be offloaded and then it would be um, reorganized in a way that would make it more amenable to analysis and, and visualization. And that new reorganized form was time history. So they actually had two different versions. Uh, Boeing um, donated HDF packet to us and which was nice. I mean, it's nice when people donate code to us, but um, Equally importantly, they, they donated funds to us to help us uh, integrate it into the um, HDF uh, uh, full package of offerings. And uh, to this day, it's one of the high-level APIs that we offer that, that is uh, most, uh, most heavily used. It's a wonderful contribution and has influenced the, the aerospace industry as well as others um, in, and gotten them to use HDF for that kind of data. Another project that uh, was really, uh, really important, I think, to us that, that, that and, and certainly a fun project was a small company called Geospeza had stumbled across HDF5 uh, and thought it would be a really a good open standard for the bioinformatics community. Uh, they wrote uh, 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 an STTR, Small Business uh, Technology Transfer, uh, a proposal to the National Institutes of Health um, to join with us as the research partner in developing uh, something that we would call BioHDF, an open binary standard for bioinformatics. Um, it was through that project that uh, we had to hire somebody to work on it, and uh, we discovered this guy, Dana Robinson, who, who knew a lot about the field and was also a crackerjack uh, programmer. Uh, and he joined our group as a result of that. And of course, the rest is history in terms of Dana's role with HDF um, and HDF5. So that was, uh, that was nice. And it also showed the industry the value of HDF, although there were other people already in the industry looking at, at HDF5. Um, one of the most fun applications that uh, came out um, was when in 2000 or so, we were getting these emails from these guys in New Zealand um, and when we asked him what they were doing with HDF5, they said they were making a movie based on Lord of the Rings, and they were using an application that used HDF5 to produce clouds and smoke. Uh, so that was our, I think, our introduction in the movie industry. Um, and it turned out some other folks were using HDF5 in other ways for CGI data. Um, and uh, Spider-Man, several Spider-Man movies were uh, used using HDF5 and played a role in the Polar Express film. Um, it hung around for maybe, I don't know, five or 10 years in the industry, but then uh, for reasons I'm really not, not too aware of, uh, didn't, didn't make it long-term. Uh, there's still stuff out there, but it mostly other, other formats are used now, unfortunately, for us. Um, Okay, so that kind of gets us into the mid 2000s um, and to what I'm calling the branching out uh, stage. Um, and uh, we, were, uh, we were running into some other crises at this point. Uh, we were at the University of Illinois with, uh, at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications and the university really only likes to do research and teaching. Uh, what we were doing was kind of problematic, especially for the grants office at the university, but for others as well. 
as well and didn't and, and, and just were kind of awkward in the university uh, system. So we decided to spin off a company. Um, we wanted to be a nonprofit uh, company because we were really driven by the mission of supporting HDF. The problem was um, to start a company with the number of people that we had um, was going to require some funds that we didn't have. Um, so we didn't really have the funds to properly start up a company. Uh, but then something happened. Um, this uh, hedge fund based in Chicago um, had been having frustrations of the type that uh, that uh, Jim Gray had been talking about in their in their paper. Um, with uh, using traditional database systems to to scale in the ways that they needed to do the kinds of analysis that they needed on their systems. And they stumbled across pie tables and played around with it and found out that it was way better than some of the other tools that they were looking. They looked under the hood, realized that HDF5 was there and learned more about HDF5 and found out that it was it had a lot of capabilities that they they wanted. Um, so uh, in, in the fall of 2004, I think it was, several of us were getting calls from this company up in Chicago, um, this hedge fund that wanted to hire us away from the university and have us go up there and work for them and help them develop HDF5. We told them we were thinking of starting a company uh, and if they would help us bankroll the company, we'd be, ha be happy to work with them. Uh, and since finance wasn't a big uh, thing in terms of our user base, uh, we would work with them exclusively. Uh, that was a requirement they had um, if they would be willing to help bankroll the beginning of the HDF group. And they were. Um, and that led to um, a, a, an opportunity not only to start the company, but to, uh, because of the non-compete part of it, we were able to, to profit quite a bit from that and use those profits to do a lot of the things that we wanted to do to help uh, further our mission. Of course, at the same time, we still had broad lab support. Both NASA and the labs were, were quite on board with our spinning off as a company and helped us move our contracts from the lab, from the universities to, to, the, uh, to, to the new company. And more labs started joining in. Um, and you know they just came and it have always been, as we've seen, um, the backbone of, of the HDF group, particularly in terms of the HPC um, aspect of, of, uh, of the technology. Um, at the same time, there were uh, other things going on in industry, and one of my one of my the favorite one one of my favorite ones was working with uh, several uh, groups like Keysight and and MathWorks. Um, who were adopting HDF5 for, uh, for uh, their data. Um, and actually several of them got together and came up with a format, uh, an interchange format specification based on uh, HDF5 that they call IVI. I don't know how heavily that is actually used, how much, but um, that was a nice, another example of people kind of trying to, to standardize. Um, but um, our relationships with them over the years have been very fruitful, have really helped us stay in touch with things that needed to development that needed to be made and, and new capabilities that needed to be added. Um, and in, in some cases, they've really been helpful in funding those as well. Uh, another important uh, breakthrough was, uh, I don't know what you call it a breakthrough, but the development was a new satellite system called the Joint Polar Satellite System. Um, this was a system for collecting and serving weather data uh, for NOAA, for the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. At that point, all three agencies had separate satellites, and they decided that was kind of silly. Why don't we put together one system? And then, because it's the same weather, and, um, and then uh, share the data from that system. And they adopted HTF5 uh, as their format. Uh, they took a very different approach from the way from the approach that NASA has taken. So there's not really compatibility. You have to do a lot of work to, to convert the data from one to another. Um, but that also led to long-term um, support for, for several years um, of the HDF group and also the development of a lot of, of, of valuable 
new uh, capabilities and tools uh, for HDF. Um, in the um, in the energy industry, HDF5 was beginning to to catch on. Um, this data exchange standard for reservoir life for the reservoir life cycle um, was based on on HDF5. We worked with the group that uh, that did that, um, and that I think helped show the way for HDF5 into that into the whole energy industry, not just fossil fuels, but the whole energy industry. And it just continues to grow to this day. Um, looking back at tools and interfaces and so forth, um, in 2008, um, a guy named Wes McKinney in the finance industry uh, developed something called Pandas, a wonderful analysis tool which supports uh, HDF5, uh, among other uh, formatted data. Um, and again, it was a good example of, of not only helping people solve problems uh, with their data in HDF5, but it also helped raise awareness of, of HDF5. Um, <clears throat> I think, though, that the biggest thing in 2008, and really one of the biggest of, of all time in the history of HDF, was the implementation of H5 Pi. Uh, uh, Andrew Collette was a researcher, and he was a Python guy, and he was working with HDF5 uh, data, and uh, he just decided, you know, let's go whole hog and create a, a, a whole API for HDF5 that uh, I can access through, through Python. Um, he wrote a book called Python and HDF5, Unlocking Scientific Data. Um, this, uh, and of course, it was open source and encouraged uh, people to join him in, in developing and supporting it. And it is now supported by an excellent community of developers. Um, the HDF group works with um, and uh, keeping it up to date. And it's uh, probably made HDF available to as many scientists uh, as all the other uh, as all the other things put together. But anyway, it's extremely popular um, and, a, and a great development that has helped us and, and helped the community. Um, I, I want to point out that it wasn't just uh, Python, though. Um, this is just, I think, a very small partial list of other libraries and language bindings. I've kept, I keep my own little list, and so this is, this is drawn from that. But several in Java, C++, Python, of course. And then other languages, um, you know, even Yorick. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm sure Mark remembers Yorick uh, from Livermore and uh, Golang and so forth. So this is a a good uh, a good example of how important it is for people to have be able to, uh, to put their own view, their own way of thinking about uh, writing code and 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 dealing with their data. Um, on top of HDF5 and the importance of us to work with them. Um, a whole lot was going on in science. I mean, there's just so much that I, it, it's hard for me to really think about how to handle this part. So I just decided I'd pick a couple of examples that are that are some of my favorites from, uh, from around that time. Uh, the first one, Surin will recognize this because he was the lead on this project was the trillion particle simulation. Um, and uh, th 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 this uh, uh, slide highlights some of the um, some of the breakthroughs of that, which is, I think maybe the first trillion particle simulation was run on 120,000 cores. Um, it reached peak IO of 35 gigabytes per second. Um, the, the data set it created was 350 terabytes. Um, and, um, and one of the things that's really interesting about it and brings us back again to the paper that Jim Gray and his colleagues wrote is the query, the need for queryability. Uh, they developed there a, a technology called fast query, uh, and fast bit, uh, for querying, uh, multidimensional scientific data, um, and fast query can index, uh, was able to index this data in uh, 10 minutes and queries could be done in three seconds, a really incredible technology. Not only that, but uh, this 
um, this wasn't just a, a, a proof of principle. It actually enabled several uh, new discoveries in, in plasma physics. So that's a, that was really a wonderful demonstration of, of uh, how HDF5 can play a small role in, in helping do some really good science. Um, another of my favorites is the low frequency array. Uh, it's an array of radio telescopes, array of small uh, radio telescopes, hundreds of them uh, spread um, uh, over a, a, ver a very long, uh, very wide um, space. I think that the long furthest one is 1500 meters, uh, 1500 kilometers from the from uh, some of the others. Um, and uh, the great thing about this was uh, that not only did they adopt HDF5, um, but they really liked to beat the bushes and tell people about how great HDF5 was for them. Um, they even organized an NSF workshop on the topic. Um, and uh, I think that through that workshop that, that Garrett and I uh, participated in, uh, they may have influenced a lot of others in the astronomy uh, world to have a look at HDF5. And we are seeing more and more people adopting it in that world. Um, but that was a great, uh, a great project. Still going strong, still generating data um, and uh, distributing it uh, in, in HDF5. Uh, so this kind of gets us to the mid 2010s and new challenges coming along. First of all, technological changes, but also there were some funding challenges for HDF itself. Um, in terms of technology, of course, data technologies don't stand still. Uh, by now, we're seeing Amazon, Google, uh, Microsoft uh, clouds becoming to maturity and more and more people using them and scientists more and more looking to ways to take advantage of that technology. Uh, in the HPC world, storage hierarchies is object storage and so forth are becoming absolutely critical uh, as well as the cloud um, and, uh, and the exascale computing project gets underway to quote, quote, to prepare for the world's first capable exit scale system, which I, if I, if I got my figures right, uh, was delivered uh, at Los Alamos um, in around uh, 2020. Um, anyway, uh, the um, ECP project led to a lot of work with the HDF group um, and uh, became I, I would probably say over the past five or five or eight years, uh, one of our major sources of work and funding and um, and new development with HDF5. Um, I won't begin to to try to list all of the different uh, names of things like you know Moab and Mochi and Deos and um, all this stuff uh, that uh, that we worked on in connection with the various labs. The Earth Observing System was kind of at steady state at this point and just has continued to um, to uh, to support us. But the big thing was that the hedge fund support ended in uh, I believe it was 2014. Um, they uh, it wasn't anything we did. Um, things happened internally and we ended up losing that. Uh, that contract, but for eight years, that had provided us with a nice cushion um, and a nice way for us to support our support activities, our R&D activities, and so forth. Um, but that was a new world, and so we had to look uh, look on for, okay, what are we going to do next? Um, but meanwhile, we were getting more involved with uh, groups like the light source community that I mentioned earlier, um, and uh, they uh, they have really supported us well, uh, not just in terms of funding, but in terms of spreading the word about how valuable HDF5 is for them. Um, they uh, funded things like Swimmer, the virtual data sets, direct chunk IO, and, and various other things. So that has been a really great partnership um, over the over the uh, over the last several years. Uh, <clears throat> another project, that I just wanted to point out is the uh, Eater Tokamak Fusion Project. Um, in 2010, they sent out, sent out a request for proposals to design a data management system using HDF5. 
we submitted a proposal, but we weren't funded. I think we were asking for too much money, but ultimately they came back to us and uh, we did. And uh, Garrett and Dana did the work. And uh, from that time on, uh, Eater became a valued uh, partner of, of the HDF group. Um, of course, one of my favorite events was when the people responsible for the LIGO project, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, um, won the Nobel Prize for Physics. Um, from the beginning, that project had been using HDF5. We didn't work a lot with them, but we worked a little bit with them, but uh, they were longtime HDF5 users even before the project. And it's just wonderful that we were able to have a chance to be a small part of, of their success. Uh, meanwhile, um, we started looking at HDF5 capabilities, uh, partly because of all these, these technological changes and partly because, frankly, of this, this uh, difference in our funding model um, outside of the library uh, itself. There was a trend towards the towards the cloud, and that was certainly important. Um, and uh, we hoped that maybe we could play a role in uh, HDF5 and and the cloud, but other things as well. One of those was an idea that Garrett came up with for a spark connector that he implemented, um, kind of as a proof proof of principle. But it actually turned out to be an add-on that we offered um, a couple years later. Uh, another little project that he did beyond that it was outside the library was uh, to use ODBC, uh, an ODBC driver. Again, we get back to the to the Jim Gray paper um, about being able to provide a queryable front end um, and using something called Pi Hex Add. He was able to create an Excel add-on that demonstrated the ability to 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 do uh, that kind of a a query and to build tools that could do that kinds of, those kinds of queries with, with HDF5. <clears throat> um, but really, the cloud was where our biggest focus was. Um, outside the library, uh, the cloud was, was what people were mostly talking about. And by then, uh, John Reedy had joined the company straight out of uh, out of Amazon and the cloud uh, team at Amazon. So he knew his stuff. Um, and uh, so that so that became a, a focus for the group. Um, since this talk is about history, I think it's worth noting that this wasn't the first time that the HDF group worked on providing remote access to HDF. And I just want to kind of go back and uh, visit some of the other attempts that we had at doing this. Um, the first one was when Mosaic was released back in 1993. Uh, it was released in fall of 92, but in early 93, um, the, the Mosaic team created something called Browserama. Uh, and what Browserama would do if it, if it saw an HDF5 file, and, uh, and excuse me, an HDF file um, and not an HTML, file, it would, um, it would immediately convert it and uh, provide an interface that would allow you to kind of fish around inside the file and look at the internals of the file. So that was our first kind of uh, attempt at, at, at doing something like that. Uh, never really caught on, but uh, it was a good proof of principle and actually led to some work that we did later where we created something called a scientific data browser as part of a project that we called Project Horizon. It's a big NASA project with a whole lot of partners on it. Um, and the, the scientific browser, browser, as it says here, was a, a web-based technology that would allow scientists to access their data uh, in a conversational mode remotely. Um, another company created something uh, based on this, using the scientific data browser uh, called Dial, uh, data, data and Information Access Link for Earth Science Data. Um, and it was used uh, throughout the uh, throughout the climate science world for accessing data uh, in certain collections for quite a quite a while after that. Um, we also have had a continuing and very positive relationship 
with the Open DAP project. Actually, in the 90s, it was just DAP. Um, but since the mid 90s, we worked with those guys. They're great to work with. We still do. We love them. Um, this is a major tool that's used by NASA and others for remotely accessing data. So we were a part of that and continue to be a part of that. Um, around 2000, um, the Cactus Project in Potsdam, Germany, um, demonstrated the ability to visualize the results of a simulation in real time. And they were early adopters of HDF5 and big supporters. And uh, this simulation was running in Potsdam and the viewer that they demonstrated was at a supercomputing conference in the US, you know, 3000 miles away. So that was a really nice kind of demo, but I, I don't think it ever went much beyond that. I don't know how much they used it internally, but that was a nice uh, example. Um, in 2006, NASA uh, gave us some money and said, could you guys try implementing another Windows, uh, Windows browser plugin, getting back to Browserama, right? But with a kind of a new look and feel. And we did that. Um, and uh, I don't know what happened. I don't know, we, maybe we just didn't do it right or maybe it just wasn't the right thing for the time but never really caught on. Um, as far as I know, it's still there, but uh, it, probably not because the technology is, is, has moved on, but that was another attempt. Um, now we're getting into the kind of the mid 2010s. Um, and in the middle of, the, of, the, of that time, Garrett proposed a restful version of HDF5 and a web user interface. Um, and uh, that was about the same time that John Reedy joined the SGF group um, out, of the, out of the Amazon cloud division. Um, and uh, he became part of that discussion. And uh, a little bit later, he proposed HDF cloud, um, which would, among other things, would support things like HDF uh, studio, um, but also all sorts of other um, access modes. So that was a proposal. I went to work on that with our, we, at that time we still had uh, plenty of R&D funds to support things like this. Um, and uh, he created something called H5 Serve. Um, and this, this was John's first implementation of H, H5 Serve. It was released in 2015. Like all first versions, it was best viewed as a prototype. Um, it had some challenges. Um, but it also demonstrated, uh, it really demonstrated well uh, how HDF5 could, could work with the cloud. Um, but uh, again, it was a really more of a prototype. And in 2016, he proposed a more robust and scalable version uh, to NASA called the Highly Scalable Data Service. Um, and NASA agreed to fund that. Um, and it did, and uh, we're happy to say that, that the result was HSDS. HSDS 0 0.1 was released first in 2017. I think we're up to, I didn't check, the 0 0.6 now or 0 0.7, um, but it's still a 0 point. Uh, so John is clearly not, not quite satisfied yet. Um, and it, but it's undergone continued improvement since then. Um, it's still in the early adopter stage, but it's getting better and better. Um, and one of my favorite examples of using HDF5 in any way is this project at the National Renewable Energy Lab, which makes a, uh, a, a wind data set um, and a solar radiation data set available uh, for querying and visualizations in, in, in really powerful ways. Um, so I think that's uh, a, good, a good example of, of how we in the HDF group can do even more uh, to work with the community to, to make HDF5 uh, available um, in, in, uh, in a variety of different ways. So that pretty much uh, brings me to the end of the presentation uh, and the end of my time. Uh, so I'll stop and thank you. Uh, I would be happy to entertain questions or comments or uh, corrections. I suspect there are quite a few corrections um, if we have time to do that. Uh, thank you.
Great. Um, Thanks, Mike. Uh, are there any questions? Real quick, Mike. Uh, Mark Miller here. Great to great to hear your voice. Sorry we uh, missed you in person, but uh, really enjoyed your uh, your summary of what's gone on in HDF the last uh, 25 years. And and congratulations on 25 years. I think that's pretty amazing. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thanks. Okay.